Welcome to this week in Missouri politics. We are joined today by a guy in the news, rising star in the Republican Party, representative of St. Charles County, Representative Nick Shore. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Appreciate you doing the Iron Man work. You were here last week on the panel. Now you're right. Uh, you're here as our featured guest. We appreciate the time. Big story this week. There was a bill for you were on the front page of the Post above right. the fold about talking about the Sunshine Law. But first, I want to break down. There was a bill moving through the legislature. It was intent overall was to apply Clean Missouri to local officials. Break down what the overall bill was supposed to do. So Clean Missouri Amendment 1 had many aspects to it. I'm surprised it even passed the uh, judicial scrutiny since there were many different topics in it. But the, the, the topics that we would have applied across the board uh, would have been campaign expenditures, uh, donations that you could receive, lobbyist turnaround, lobbyist gift bans. Um, a lot of the ethical things that we've been trying to push since 17 and 18 that finally did get um, passed in Amendment 1, we applied that from the municipal level all the way to the statewide. Uh, something that needs to be done. If we, you know, I don't understand how a, a sitting senator or a sitting representative is bound by certain campaign expenditures, but then they can run at the same time for school board mm -hmm. or uh, county commissioner and raise unlimited amounts and then drop out of that race and apply it back to the, the race for Senate or the race for uh, House. So it's a floor debate too that was interesting where you talked about how if you're on a school board or a city council, you're directly uh, releasing bonds that are, can be tens of millions of dollars and you can take lobbyist gifts. But even in legislature, you're somewhat removed from some of that. There's some, a lot of institutional choices that happen before actually somebody can get a bonding contract or whatever. It is more direct at the local level, so it makes sense if you're going to apply it to the state level, it should be applied at local level. Oh, it really does. I think it was a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, and it's something that the, the, the sponsors from Ed Dogan have been pushing for several years. We finally uh, got it into the Senate again, and hopefully we, we know that they're going to make some amendments, as they always sure. do. Um, but, yeah, I, I put an amendment on there that we've been working on since uh, Amendment 1 passed. And since legislators, since the 70s, the legislators have never been bound by the Sunshine Law. Case law, uh, Hawkins versus City of Fayette, says that for the Sunshine purposes, legislators are not to be interpreted as employees. So there's no real definition that we would fall under. The Post-Dispatch's um, primary First Amendment attorney, David Martineau, says that uh, the way that the Sunshine Law is to apply to us is the same way that it and the exceptions apply to local governments. So when you look at the, the treatise, the, uh, the guidebook from the Missouri Bar, attorneys that study and are experts on the Sunshine Law, they've indicated that a lot of these exceptions, such as the ability to redact Social Security numbers, doesn't apply to local governments. So break it down, though. You have a constituent, right, in St. Charles County, send you, they have a problem with Medicaid. Right. They send you their information, so they send you, I've had these illnesses, this is my Social Security number, this is my Medicaid card number, maybe. They send that to your official government email. Right now, no one's done it yet, but there's ambiguity that you could sunshine request. Now, many news outlets do sunshine your emails, which is right. a very fine practice. But you're saying you're trying to prevent that from going to the media ever. Yeah, and we saw, and, and I'll get to that, but we saw back in December, of eight, December 18th of 2018, uh, Senator Ed Emery, uh, was, his constituents were put mm -hmm. by name, the location where they live, and their emails within the post. So we know that it's being done. We know that it can be done, and now that the session is up and running and we've got constituents that are dealing with issues such as Medicaid, we don't want to risk that private information, such as their Social Security numbers or identifying information. I find information. it interesting. I mean, you're talking about a paper that's made a big deal out of this. They're a paper that literally put out the name of someone who was a potential rape victim right. uh, in Jefferson City. Talking about a group that's that's a member of an organization that, that one of the few papers in the history ever voted to not follow the sunshine law when appropriating government uh, government taxpayer resources. It is an interesting, it's all, it's a, it's almost uh, the sea of hypocrisy sometimes when they complain about this. Where does this stand? Do you think this comes back from the Senate with your amendment attached? Well, I think it's going to come back uh, with some form of my amendment attached. We've, we've been working on this since uh, December. We've asked the other side, the Democrats, to come forward as certain members, and we saw the, on the vote, we saw that this was bipartisan supported, and uh, we know that the, the, the Senate appreciates and wants to protect constituent uh, confidentiality. So it's going to come back with a form of it on there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if history repeats itself, they're going to do some tweaking over there. Sure. That's the way it works. Let's talk about a commission that includes centers that you're on. You mentioned Rising Star. You're the head of JCAR. Uh, yes. People, that is a, a pretty inside government term, but essentially all the bills you pass, the departments have to come up with rules to implement them, and you approve the rules. Uh, it, that's particularly interesting this session because the medical marijuana is being was was passed by the voters, so now they're trying to implement rules. Tell me about JCAR, your role in it, and where the mar medical marijuana stuff, when it hits your committee, what it'll look like. So, as you stated, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules uh, will oversee all the rulemaking. Uh, once the agencies make the rules, it goes out to public hearing, it gets posted, 
we can decide if we want to have a hearing on that and if the rule is going to stick or not. We can decide to um, you know, deny that rule, so to speak. So mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're very excited to, to work with Health and Senior Services on um, their implementation of these rules for medical marijuana. We know that it's going to help a lot of people. We want to get it out there. We think that the rules are going to be done by April. Um, so we could be going after session. We could still be working on this stuff. But I know that this week uh, coming up, I think it's Wednesday, that they're going to have a forum on kind of where they are in the rulemaking sure. process right now. Interesting. That's a commission that's been a former now Congressman Jason Smith has been a part of it. Eric Schmidt, the <clears throat> Attorney General, has been the chair. It's an, it's a it's one of those days more powerful than anybody knows, right? Yeah, and you know there were a lot of members that were asking me after uh, Elijah Har entrusted me this position. They didn't know what J Car was, yeah. and it's something that if you're really not within the quasi judicial realm of of the rulemaking process, you you really don't know what it is. Every time you're on the show, we talk about criminal justice reform. You did raise the age. What are you working on this year? Again, uh, I stated last week, Bobby Bostic um, he is a gentleman who is 16 years old. Not really had a, he didn't really have a criminal record prior to then, but um, some crimes on one night with an older gentleman. Uh, the older gentleman's going to be getting out, and he got sentenced to 241 years, didn't kill anybody, didn't seriously injure anybody, didn't rape anybody, and actually stopped a rape from occurring. Um, so this is outside of the legislative realm. We're working with the governor's administration. Uh, we've got 40, maybe 50 signatures already on board, bipartisan support. Uh, we're going to be working in the Senate with Brian Williams and Tony Lutkemeyer mm -hmm. on, um, on getting some support over there. But we've got uh, Cody Smith's uh, mandatory minimum uh, removal or reform. And a lot of other good things that are going to save taxpayer dollars, but also put people who are reformed back at work. Talk about your fentanyl bill and what is fentanyl for people that might not have a clue. <clears throat> so fentanyl with the opioid epidemic um, just going crazy, not only across Missouri, but across the, the nation. Opioid uh, abuse is rampant and fentanyl, uh, it, it's, you know, a form of a painkiller. It's put in patches. It's actually uh, prescribed in micromilligram fashion. And it was about a week or two weeks ago mm -hmm. at the border, 254 pounds were seized. That was enough to kill 50-something million Americans. Wow. Yes, it's very powerful stuff. And then there's car fentanyl, which is a derivative thereof. Uh, and, and on our trafficking statutes, that's not in there. So fentanyl, car fentanyl, that's not in there. So when these big busts occur, which we've seen for the past couple of years, and this bill came out of committee unanimously last year, we're hoping to do it again this year, but it would add that into the trafficking statute. So us at the state level, uh, when the feds choose not to go after the little guys, we actually have uh, the ability to do so. But we're also adding, uh, I'm working with uh, Speaker Elijah Har on this, we're adding uh, date rape drugs into this as well. Date rape drugs, their only use is for uh, horse tranquilizers, and we've seen uh, an increase in people actually trafficking those as well. Representative Nick Shore, congratulations on the fame. I can tell you firsthand. Uh, above the full post of space story, does a lot for your career. Yes, yeah, right above Donald Trump, so <laughs> I loved it. And I had the editorial section as well. Can't beat it. Thanks for joining us. We'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. Jeff Rainford joins the show, but first, go to showmemissouri.com. This week we talked about the history of the state capitol with Dana Radom and Bob Perdue. No one knows more about the subject than him and Lieutenant Governor Mike Keogh. Show me Missouri, that's how it's supposed to be spelled, with an A-H.com. History of Missouri, one county in this case, one capital at the time. We'll be right back after this. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Looking to get quality insurance at a price you can afford? Now you can, thanks to CFM Insurance. Select from our broad range of farm, home, and rental property coverage. Find an agent right in your local area, as CFM is represented by a network of 200 independent agencies throughout Missouri. For personal and dependable service, from a company with a history of insuring the families of Missouri that dates back to 1869, visit weinsuremissouri.com and find an agent near you today. 
All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. At Amer in Missouri, we know what light can do. It draws people together and chases monsters away. And if you shine it in the right direction, it will light the path for the next generation, showing them what their tomorrow could look like and spotlighting the possibilities that lay in front of them. Investing in our community by lighting the way forward. That's energy at work. Amer in Missouri. Welcome back this week in Missouri Politics Opinion Maker Panel Time. Former Senator Jeff Smith, welcome back to the show. Good to be here. Jeff Rainford, I wasn't going to call you a Democratic strategist, but I think maybe just a winning strategist. I mean, you might be the only guy in St. Louis with more wins than Adam Wainwright. Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back. Representative Jim Murphy from South County, St. Louis, first bill through the legislature. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. A lot of people serve a long time and don't see the Senate actually pass a House resolution like that. Now, especially since it's the, uh, the 100th and it was the first one through. I'm, I'm really, really honored by that, but I'm, I'm more honored for Gloria Brown. She sure. was the one that deserved it. Well, congratulations. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Phil Chris Finelli been on the show many times. I'm going to jump right into this. The, uh, your colleague from St. Charles County, Nick Shore, big to do this week about a bill. Basically, you were taking Clean Missouri and applying it to the local jurisdictions as well. There was a sunshine uh, provision there that really blew up, cut through all the hype. What, what, did it, what were you actually trying to do with the legislation? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I have no problem if folks want to read my emails, my official email account, but I do have a problem when people want to read my constituents' emails to me, because very often people share very personal stories about their lives. Sometimes they have political views that are unpopular that could harm them with their employer or their community, and those should remain private. And what Nick was trying to do was apply a very important protection to make sure that constituent communications to their representatives in Jefferson City are protected from public disclosure. So let me break this down. If you're a person that has an issue with your Medicaid or your health care, whatever, do, do these people actually send you their social security numbers and things to your government email? I've received all sorts of personal information about people who are sending things that they have a problem with a, a domestic dispute or they have a problem with um, their kid at school, a bullying issue, very personal information that gets sent to me and they, they're asking their legislators for help. Uh, and there's a lot of help that we can provide, but I, I fear that there's going to be a chilling effect on constituent communication after we had the Post-Dispatch just a couple weeks ago published constituent letters, the names and what they were telling their legislators in the newspaper. So just with that being, look, this is a Post-Dispatch that has outed a potential rape victim's name in, in grandiose fashion and had one of their editors fired from a college over it. I mean, these are not people that, that are traditionally that much on keeping private communications private or maybe even being responsible with them. It's a surprise that they're the ones suing over it. Well, um, I appreciate what uh, Representative Cristofanelli said. Um, just to kind of validate that or corroborate that, a lot of people are sometimes confused about what level of government deals with certain issues or even you know whether government can, can address certain things and so you will get a, a voluminous amount of you know very personal stories and communications and people are looking for help for how to navigate this labyrinth known as government and so oftentimes people will send things to you that are more appropriate for other types of offices or mo more appropriate you know there are health care issues that do come up and so uh, I am sensitive to, to the concern that's raised. Representative Murphy, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I should say they sued over uh, the pot, people applying for pot applications. They made a big fuss over this. I mean, there is a little group in the Capitol called the Press Association. They have a little group that administers a few taxpayer perks. When they meet, they, may, they voted not to apply the Sunshine Law to them. Seems a little do what we say, not what we do. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in the debate, uh, we, we, we are taking in, you know, they can, they can have everything I write. They can have everything I say, and they can make it public. But if, if a constituent writes me and talks about their child and a problem they're having, and this becomes public and they're, they're now bullied because of it, I mean, this is just wrong. And, and to call us racist and all these other things, and we're, we're against the will of the people. No, we're not against the will of the people. We're, we're, we're for protecting them. And I think the media has done good jobs, like in committee hearings, right? 
it seems to me like if you're having a public committee hearing, you should be able to record that if you want to, right? Absolutely. Most of those things, but but I think in this situation, I'm not sure they've had, actually had the license to complain the way they behave that some of those communications shouldn't be private. I, I absolutely agree, and they need to be. Jeff Rainford, it's an interesting thing. You deal with a lot of local officials. The intent of this bill was to make Clean Missouri apply to local officials. What effect does that have? Well, under the Sunshine Law, I mean, we already uh, have to, when I was in city government, I was there for 14 years, we had to reveal everything, whether it was constituent or not, and the issues that you brought up never became a thing for us. Everything that I had, everything that we received, we had a thing called the Citizen Service Bureau. Everything they got, they get 10,000 requests for services every year from constituents. The problem that you describe hasn't happened at the local level, and I, I don't think it's going to happen at the state level. The part of this, though, that I don't like is the idea that, uh, that, that anything that's in the public record or should be in the public record regarding um, decisions made about legislation would also be exempt from the Sunshine Law. And, and I strongly disagree with that. I think that the more people know about their government, the better it is. Now, can we deal with individual issues like uh, saying that you could black out people's names and their social security numbers and their addresses? I don't have a problem with that. But this seems to be going way too far as far as protecting what I actually believe is people's right to know. But the interesting thing about it is the Sunshine Law is the lifeblood of the press. And the press is not going to be able, the they're not going to be able to stop this, which tells you how far, how weak our press is nowadays. But Maybe do you, think the, years do you ago, think the reason they, they are that weak is thing. because they don't want it to apply to them? No, I, I, listen, I was a reporter a long time ago. You do writing. I, I, don't, I, I don't buy the, the, you know, the fact that, 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 you know, do as I say, not as I do. I think they are trying to do a job. I, and I think that there are not enough if of them. I think they're not getting the paid record. enough. But I'll say, yeah, in some respects, the legislature brought this on itself. Uh, yeah. A few years ago, you know, they were having, there were committee hearings literally at Jefferson City Country Club, you know, over lobbyist sure. paid dinners. Uh, far away from, from the public gaze and only through uh, kind of muckraking investigative journalism was that exposed. So there are some underlying reasons for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, I like think even you might have pointed out or some House members, the House has passed ethics reform. The way Clean Missouri came about was using ethics reform as a way to bring in a redistricting plan. The ethics reform died in the Senate. Maybe that if they had listened to the House two, three, four years ago, it might not have been as easy to pass in the first place. Absolutely. The vast majority of Clean Missouri had provisions that were passed through the House two years ago, and they failed in the Senate, and we should have done the right thing two years ago, and this wouldn't be a problem. Let's talk about something that's coming up, I believe, uh, next week, possibly for a final vote. Prescription drug monitoring, something the House has worked on in the past. It kind of goes back and forth from the Senate not liking it to the House not liking it. Senator Schaaf predated you. He was always very much against it. Uh, it's basically if you're on certain prescription drugs, those go on the database, the government keeps them, so you can't abuse the system. A lot of the state, your constituents are already underneath it. Does that pass next week? Um, if it gets out of the Senate. So that passed the House? It'll pass, I think it'll pass the House. I really do. Yeah, it'll definitely pass the House. I was one of the 45 Republicans that vote no, but the, it takes more than 45 Republicans to stop a bill. So uh, I think it'll get out. Uh, Give me the case against it. You know, I, I think that we already have an executive order that focuses on the providers to find when they're out of step with their prescriptions and then focus on them instead of the patients. I think that most of the state is already covered by this. Uh, this bill is not even mandatory for the doctors to use. So quite frankly, I think it costs a lot of money and doesn't work. And so I'm a no. Do you think you can stop people from doing drugs? Well, I actually think, I applaud them for what they're doing, and I don't think that somebody ought to be able to accumulate uh, prescription drugs uh, by you know, going doctor to doctor. But I will say there is an underlying issue here, um, in, you know, particularly in rural Missouri, parts of uh, you know, some of the suburbs. Um, the world has changed. You know, we, people used to have manufacturing jobs, and men could make things and go to work and do things, and that's been taken away from them, and they're looking for our alternatives. We're seeing fewer people going to church and more people doing drugs, fewer men Men especially white men are working and more are using drugs there's an underlying issue here so I actually think I applaud what they're doing and I'm hundred percent for it I actually think the governor's more on the right track with really focusing on workforce development and yeah. being able to put um, all people of all stripes to work um, and I think when people are working and have a purpose in their lives they're a lot less likely to turn to drugs but I still applaud what they're doing I think they're right I mean, to me, they say 85, 87 percent of the state's already underneath it. I wonder what that 13 percent of the state that's not, what the drug situation is like there. Do you think this moves the needle even if it gets done? 
Uh, it's tough to say, I, but I think interestingly, it it points to a larger institutional issue around our state legislature: the degree to which one senator can really yes. hold up public policy for eight years. You know, which Dr. Schaff uh, did for a long time. So it'll be interesting to see if any senator emerges to pick up the mantle of opposition to PDMP. All right, prediction time. Does it pass? I think it will. Yes. What do you think? Uh, I think it will. I think the need is really there. I think they're on the right track, and it's good public policy, and I think that will uh, that'll push it through. Does it pass? Dies in the Senate. Does it pass? I have my doubts. It gets oh, I'm going to double Senate. down. Who kills it? Ander. <laughs> I think that might be the case. It'd be interesting to see a doctor as with Shop. I think that helps Shop's credibility that's being that's a doctor. That's my allergist. I hope he doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's talk about education. This is a representative I've always felt like educated. I heard a smart guy one time say, these are suburban legislators dragging rural legislators to change schools in urban areas that don't want to change. This year, they want to talk about expanding charter schools to outstate Missouri, I guess. What are the, well, give, me the, give me what education reform means uh, right now in the state of Missouri. Well, I, I think that there are two priorities. One of them is charter schools, which we heard in the House direct this last week. Uh, and next week, we'll hear my bill, Education Savings Accounts, which mm -hmm. would allow flexibility at the student-based level. So uh, well, that difference there is, right, you can go to, like, uh, my daughter goes to Holy Infant. Could you use that education savings account to send her there? If she was going to a public school right now and, and the public school was not meeting her needs, she very well could be eligible. Yeah. So that's a, that's a pretty big break, right, in, in education policy. What, where's, the, where's the debate on that and does that move? Uh, I think that we are finally at a point where we're going to move education reform out of the House. Uh, we're going to try to finish the unfinished legacy of our Speaker Todd Richardson. I know that education reform is very important to our new Speaker, Elijah Haar. We now have an education chairman, Rebecca Raber, who is an avid school reformer and former teacher. Uh, we have an education committee that's ready to move these bills, and so I, I think that's going to get more traction than it ever has in the past. Jeff Raymer, to talk about school reform, and since you're talking about taking it and, 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 and infusing the private sector into it, uh, usually, I've always found it interesting, the, the, the reservation of that usually comes from rural legislators. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is is that the rural school districts are politically very powerful. Sometimes they're the biggest employer in those rural areas. Where I come down on this, and I, <laughs> I'm still getting a little scary because I agree with both of them again, uh, but I look at it from a little different way. I think that uh, how I thought about the education of my daughter, and I would much rather my wife and I make the decisions about what is, what is best for my daughter and not have something foisted on us or forced upon us by... Um, a special interest by a school district, by unions, by adults, or by whatever the issue is. I've, we've thought long and hard about how to educate uh, Claire, our daughter, and I think most parents think that way. And I think we have to trust parents to make the right decisions. What we can do for parents, besides giving them more choices, is give them more information. Because it can be confusing for parents to figure out what the best option is for them. But the idea that you either have to spend a lot of money to send your kid to a private school, or you got to sell your house and, and maybe take on a mortgage that you can barely afford because it's in a good school district in order to educate your kids, and all the things that parents do today is ridiculous. We need to make it easy for parents to get a good public school education for their kids, and I think charter schools is the right way to go about that. Yes, Smith, it seems like there's a lot of folks in the St. Louis area, maybe the Kansas City area, that want charter schools. I think folks in Neelyville, Missouri, where I'm from, think their school's fine. Is there not a way to just keep it centered in the cities? Well, I think um, in previous years, there's been legislation to ensure that uh, districts that had lost their full accreditation, that were provisionally accredited, could take advantage of more school choice. Representative Murphy uh, uh, alluded to that in, in the St. Louis district. And I'm going to take it one step further than you did. I don't just think that it was beneficial for kids uh, from unaccredited districts coming down to, was it Melville? Uh, mm -hmm. The Melville School District. I also think it's probably really good for Melville students. We're in a change, it's not just education that's changing, it's America that's changing, right? In, in about 20 years, whites are gonna be in the minority, right? We're going to, there'll be a plurality, but the majority of the country will be uh, people of color. And everybody has to grow up and learn how to live in diverse atmospheres, and so I think it's healthy for everybody. That's why I uh, supported, you know, uh, charter schools, but also supported open enrollment across public school district lines, which I think is the truest form of school choice. Well, there's no busing that's going to change most rural Missouri districts. The, the the demographic makeup of it is there. Is the system not working now, where you can do a lot of these things in St. Louis and Kansas City, but you're not really messing with the school district down in Christian County? Yeah, I, most of the charter and education reform bills are focused on the big big counties, and you know it's just simply not the case that somebody's going to put a charter school in Nixon, mm -hmm. Missouri. There's not the population base, there's not the demand, and I don't think there's any threat there. 
Interesting. Well, the bill also says uh, communities of 30,000 or more. You could bump that up to 50,000 if you wanted to make sure. And the representative is right. There's never been a charter school opened and they open the doors and hope somebody shows up. The charter schools only open when there are parents clamoring for them. And if parents love their local school district or their local school, there's not even going to be an opening or a thought about a charter school. So good public schools got nothing to worry yeah, about. Yeah, let the market work in, yeah. that, in that regard. So we have you here and have one, a couple seconds left. You've been a proponent of Better Together, integrating the city and the county for a long time now. Give me the 15-second elevator pitch as to why people in the state should support it. Uh, why people in the state should support it is because St. Louis, the St. Louis metropolitan area is our economic driver. It's where the jobs are, it's where the revenue is generated, and we are going in the wrong direction. We are falling way behind, and we're starting to fall behind at an accelerated pace. And it's not just that we're falling behind the cool places like Portland and San Francisco and Austin. We're starting to fall behind Indianapolis and Louisville and Nashville's really uh, kicking our teeth right now. And we are, we spend so much time fighting against each other, competing against each other, other being against each other while the rest of the world um, they're getting their you know they are organizing around economic development and workforce development and we're not doing that and the bottom line is this I think most people will tell you that they think st. Louis is headed in the wrong direction does anybody know what the plan is to turn that around does anybody even can we even agree on who's supposed to be putting that plan together and of course the answer is no see that's why I can tell you from st. Louis he thinks Portland's cooler in Pineville Missouri but with a, <laughs> with a minute left who won the week uh, Frank Brown uh, the, the Brown family is yep. uh, is honored by uh, by the Memorial Highway. And Former representatives. And we're very yeah. happy for them. Who won the week? Uh, my colleague, Gene Evans, who is yes. now leaving us in the House Please. and joining Missouri Republican Party as their executive director. Excellent pick. I think it shows that they know where, to, where they need to focus going forward. Democrats are in a lot of trouble. Who won the week? I hope all the viewers are sitting down, but three Republicans <laughs> won the week. Representative Dogan, Representative Cody Smith, and Representative Tom Hannigan from St. Charles. They passed uh, some really substantial criminal justice reform bills that are going to save Missourians millions of dollars and potentially prevent us from having to build two new prisons, which would cost about $400 million. Who won the week? Lewis Reed, the president of the St. Louis Board of Aldermen. Poll came out that showed he was well ahead of his two rivals, and off that poll, uh, he's using it well to build momentum for his campaign. I'm going to have to say Senator Doug Lively, his family come together, donated an entire building on the campus at Three Rivers College back in, uh, back in southeast Missouri. The winningest basketball coach of all time, Gene Best, coaches in there. So I would say Senator Doug Lively, his family, for that very generous donation to Three Rivers Community College. We hope you'll be very generous with your time next week and watch on This Week in Missouri Politics from Kansas City. This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank. We just finished up this week's show, and I appreciate a second to tell you about a new thing we're doing. I'm a history buff, like I know a lot of you are if you watch the show. We're doing a thing of the history of Missouri. We're going to do it one county at a time. We call it Show Me Missouri. We're going to travel to all 114 counties of the state. We'll have a member of the Farm Bureau, a county elected official, some of your state legislators you see here on the show. We're going to talk about the history, what's happening now in the county, and how the two are interconnected. It's a passion project of mine. If you like history, I hope you'll get involved. Follow us. Uh, go to MissouriTimes.com. You can see it. We'll probably branch it off into its own social media at some point. But you've been so good to us at the Missouri Times, the show, different papers. This is a passion project that I hope you'll enjoy. It's called Show Me Missouri. The history of Missouri, one county at a time. The first county was Polk County. We had a great time. And we hope you'll uh, go to MissouriTimes.com, find out a little bit about it. And if you like the history of the state, I hope you'll enjoy it. Thanks a lot.